Okay, there's a count up timer. So, so my name is Brian Exelbeer, and um, I'm responsible for the bad parts of this presentation. And this is? I'm Dusty Mabe. I'll be pushing buttons today. <laughs> so th this talk is uh, bringing developers into the flock. And uh, it is online and available uh, under my GitHub account uh, in this project space. And there's a directory called Flock 2016 Developers. And the URL gets really long if you write all of that up. So we kind of have two items on our agenda today. We want to introduce people to the Atomic Developer Bundle, the ADB. And then secondly, we want to talk about why that is actually important to the Fedora project. So to get started with, the ADB. Well, what is the ADB not? So let's just address this up front. It is not the Asian Development Bank, and it is not the Android Debug Bridge. Names are really, really hard, and we have an open issue if you would like to have a conversation about the ADB name. But my one request is just move forward with us, run with it. We are not competing with Android. It's a very small project Android. We're going to overpower them anyway, so it's, it's not important. We're starting to step up. So what is the ADB actually? Um, the project itself has, has given us this project definition, and I will read one slide to you, and it's this one. Um, the Atomic Developer Bundle ADB is a pre-packaged development environment filled with production-grade pre-configured tools that makes container developers' lives easier. The ADB supports the development of multi-container applications against different technologies and orchestrators while providing a path that promotes best practices. Um, this is a mouthful. We also take PRs against this. Um, but this is kind of the project statement and goal. And we've come a long way. So uh, Project Atomic is uh, responsible for the ADB. And we, we thought about this and we were like, why are people actually going to do this? We started with this why. And this is the stuff we came up with. We're targeting developers. Not all developers are like our Fedora contributors. They don't all necessarily want to run their own computers. They don't all want to have to think about how to do the system setup and configuration. They are using various operating systems. Not all of them are using a Linux or a Fedora. They're using complex tools as a part of a DevOps container environment. Setting up some of these orchestrators like Kubernetes or OpenShift is not trivial. And you don't want your developers spending a lot of time thinking about how to get the environment right before they can even do their job. The second piece is that as we've moved into containers, the actual environment on a developer's PC has become significantly more important down the line. So if there's a mismatch there, it's harder to fix it when you get to production because we're passing entire blobs of data and, and bits down the line. So our goals are to give it easy multi-environment support, whether that's OS or language or orchestrator and container development environment, whether that's development model, whether you use a GUI IDE, whether you use CLIs, whether you use SSH into a box. Um, and we want it to be production grade, self-contained, and open sourced. So what does all of that that I've just said actually mean? It means that we're providing a pre-configured virtual machine. We are leveraging a bunch of different virtualization providers so that it's easy to run. And we're highly integrating it into the host environment. Um, we are using a project called Vagrant SSHFS, rewritten mostly by this man, to do file sharing so that it's very cross-platform and zero config. Um, we're doing a lot of environment variables and configuration for the developers. And then we've wrapped everything into an easy to use package that we call Vagrant Service Manager. So it's easier to show than tell. So we'll do a little show and tell. And I've lost my piece of paper that tells me what I'm supposed to show you. OK. So the first thing is everyone can hopefully see and read my screen. Uh, it is a Vagrant box. So first I'm going to show you I don't have Docker, and I happen to be running Linux. So Linux is, you know, Fedora is smart enough to go, would you like Docker? This isn't true for all developers. So I am going to first Vagrant up a box. And we're only going to boot. We're going to show you two environments, but I'm only going to boot one of them just because it takes a non-trivial amount of time, and it makes me nervous to be staring at a screen 
just for the record, if you're not familiar with Vagrant, I'm doing a talk on Vagrant right after lunch. Uh, so if you're interested in more about that tool, come to my talk. Strongly, strongly encouraged. Um, lots of, lots of, Vagrant is extraordinarily chatty. You, you kind of get used to that. So I have also downloaded a plugin called Vagrant Service Manager. And we have built into Vagrant Service Manager a lot of helper things, like an env command to give you all of your environmental setup. So this is just providing us with our Docker environment variables. Um, we have set this up so that it's trivial to eval. And now I've got a Docker environment. The problem is I still can't run Docker because I don't have Docker. So the answer for a lot of people would be use your package manager. If you're on a Linux, um, go hunting around in the various Docker repos. If you're not on Linux, what we've said instead is let's just make it easy for developers. So we have given them an install CLI command for our environments so they can install Docker. In this case, they could install OpenShift. Um, there's not a marathon as far as I know CLI, so they can't install that. But when there is, they will be able to. Um, and it's just putting it in the path for us. Uh, again, it's an evaluable command, but it's just one line. So, um, And now I can run Docker. Thrilling. I have no Docker images. Uh, let's pull one. I think by law, I'm required to show you the minimal Docker example, uh, which you'll see as soon as this is finished pulling. Would have been really embarrassing if I didn't have internet. Um, all right, so I, I, shockingly, I've now pulled Fedora. Um, we can all do the standard run a container, get a bash prompt, cat Etsy, Fedora release, ooh, Fedora 24. Um, so that's not terribly interesting. Um, Slightly more interesting is this. I've written a small Docker file. This Docker file literally just tries to ls a directory. And that directory is slash workdir. So I'm going to build this right quick. I'm going to call it bex test, which is extraordinarily creative. Um, runs in relatively trivial time. My laptop's a little slow. Um, and so now let's run it. As expected, it fails because slash workdir is not a standard directory in Fedora, so there's nothing you can ls. Where it gets a little more interesting for the ADB, um, and we, we can do this on Mac, we can do this on Windows, but we're at flock, um, is that I'm gonna just map in my current working directory to be slash workdir in the container. Those are the files that it sees. Those are the files that I have. They are the same files. Uh, to continue to prove that point, I'll touch foo and run the container again. Um, and you see foo. Why is this interesting? This is interesting because you are seeing me map a directory into a Docker container running on a Docker daemon that's inside of a virtual machine on my box. So what is that going on behind the scenes? If we go into the box itself, um, there's a lot of things mounted, but the most important ones are these here at the bottom. We're using uh, Vagrant. We should probably do that. Uh, that. We're using Vagrant SSH to do a, a fuse mount of the home directory off of my box, my actual Linux box, which is home Bexelby and it's being mounted into the same place inside of the virtual machine. If I was on a Mac, it would be mounting users Bexelby into slash users Bexelby. This way, I don't have to think about the fact that this is a daemon running inside of a virtual machine, potentially somewhere else, it, you know, in terms of on my computer, it's gonna create the exact same pathing for me. As a developer, I now have no friction. Um, this is not necessarily new, but it's now being done completely open source. It's being done with uh, things that are within the possible control of Fedora, and we'll talk about that at a later time. 
The other thing that I'll show you before I let Dusty do a demo right quick is uh, the service manager command. Service manager. And I can't spell something. Vagrant service manager dash help. Oh, I'm inside the box. <laughs> Vagrant service manager help. We've added some other features to it, uh, easy ways to get to the IP address, version information of what's going on to control services like Docker or other orchestrators, restarting, stopping, status, um, to install all of these CLIs. This is an area where we're continuing to grow the project so that we can continue to remove friction for our developer audience of choice. And I think I will turn it over to you. Cool. Um, Your we'll paper. do a little laptop switch here. Uh, so Brian just showed you, I guess, uh, the CDK or the ADB. The CDK is the downstream uh, name of the project. The ADB is the upstream name of the project. So he just showed you running just the plain Docker uh, provider within the ADB. I'm going to show you actually running um, the OpenShift provider. So let me see if I can get my screen set up. And we will zoom in on this some to see if we can get you to see these things. So let me go here and I have to... So I brought up a machine earlier that is using or bringing up the OpenShift, um, I guess, provider within the ADB. I'm just going to run through and show you the output of that real quick. I didn't want to run it live because it actually does go and download, um, you know, upstream Docker direct or sorry, upstream OpenShift directly from OpenShift um, and run it. Uh, so I, from the vagrant up at the very top, here's the output that comes out. And if we scroll down here just a little bit. You can see where it actually pulls the um, Docker images for OpenShift directly from upstream. Um, and in this case, we're downloading uh, version 1.2.0. Um, that's configurable. So like if a newer version comes out and the ADB hasn't been updated, you can actually configure it to go test out an alpha version if you wanted to or whatever else. So that's kind of neat. But it also prints out some useful information for you right um, you know, here at the bottom. So it tells you. The OpenShift console is at this location, and it also tells you the username and password for a normal user. It also tells you the username and password for the equivalent of a root user in OpenShift land. And it also tells you how to use the um, OC command line tools to do the same thing. So let's check out and look at what the OpenShift console looks like. Um, so this is what it looks like when you first uh, approach it. And I will type in OpenShift dev and bell. And now we actually have um, a, a web console into the OpenShift instance. And so with the ADB, you can either choose to use uh, like CLI tools, or you could choose to use uh, like web, the web console if you want to. So let me just run through the web console real quick and create a new project called Flock. So we'll create Flock, and we'll also step through, um, you know, adding something to this project, nothing too interesting, just an example, Node.js application. Um, so I'll click on that. It actually has uh, a Git repo that it uses as a source for this example. So you could actually edit the Git repo and you know modify the source if you wanted to. So it's pulling it from directly from Git. So I'll go ahead and do create. And it says application created. Um, and so we'll just continue to the overview screen where it shows you basically what applications you have that are running or configured to be running. Um, and you can also click view log for this build that's going on in the background. So this is kind of the stuff that's going on that will create a container image that you will then run. Um, so that's the web console part of it. Let me show you how to actually do it if you wanted to do it all via the command line. So uh, Brian talked a little bit about Vagrant Service Manager um, and the EMD command to actually set up your Vagrant environment. So I'll just run that here. Uh, oops, where are we? Uh, I'm in the wrong place. Um, all right, let's see if this works. 
Okay, so basically here are all of those same variables that uh, he showed you a minute ago. It shows us how to connect to Docker if we want to connect to Docker directly. It tells us how to connect to OpenShift if we want to do that. And it also tells us exactly how to populate our environment um, for configuring and connecting to that. So let's just run this eval command, which will just set all this stuff up for us. And now let's run, I don't know if I have, uh, okay, all right, cool. So let's do OC login and we'll basically, yeah. So you see right here, uh, it actually tells you when you run Vegas, Vegas Service Manager ENV um, exactly what command you need to run to log in. And we had, it told us that uh, the username and password were OpenShift Dev and Devel. So here I am, I'm logged in, and uh, you can just run OC who am I, I think. Um, and it tells you who you are. Uh, so, and now we can actually switch project to the Flock project that we just created. So now I'm using the Flock project on the local server, um, or the server running on the ADD. And now let me just look at um, the pods that are running. And you can see from that example application that we created, uh, there was a build that was started, which is this pod down here, and then there was uh, another pod that was created after that build completed, right? And so if we just do OC logs on the build, um, you can actually see all of those same logs that you were looking at in the web console over here. So this is pretty much the same thing. So as a developer, you would have a choice between using the web console or the command line client. It doesn't matter whichever one works. Um, you know, just another example of that is you can run uh, OC get routes, and that will show you how you can actually connect to the service that's up and running. So I'll just open that. Um, I'll copy it and paste that into a terminal. And you can hit enter. And now that Node.js application that we had just started from the example Git repo is up. The other way to do that is to go into the web console and click on overview, and you can click directly on that link right there, and it does the same thing. So console, uh, you know, CLI or web console, you can do either one. That's kind of the idea. And you know, one thing that we're doing. Uh, with the ADB now is we're pulling those images from Docker. With Fedora, we could actually use the package version of, um, of OpenShift if we wanted to, or whatever we wanted to do. So it could be an opportunity for us to test those bits that are in Fedora as well as in CentOS with the ADB project. So, you wanna talk some more? Sure. I'll bring up the, uh, yes. So this is the demo slide. Yeah. Sweet. So, we'll ask bit about the project itself. Uh, what does the future hold? One of the things that we're working on right now is persistent storage. So there's a lot of opportunities for contribution here. Um, we are moving to Landrush, which is a private DNS system that exists on the box, as opposed to using an external service like Ship.io, which you saw in the URL. Uh, we love documentation, and we are continuing to innovate in that area. And we strongly encourage people to help us there. Um, we are doing tests and test driven development. Every project needs tests. And if you haven't done a lot of TDD, uh, this is an opportunity to join a project where that's being very heavily pushed. Uh, and then, of course, Vagrant Service Manager is going to continue to get uh, the install CLI extension. Actually, we want to extend that further. We want to add more pieces. There's an embarrassing open bug right now that involves Florida for redirects that I think is almost fixed, but if not, yeah, there's that. Um, we're also working on things like Windows PowerShell detection so that environment variables, especially under Windows, can come out correctly. Um, it's kind of random whether you need Unix style environment variables or CEDEX style environment variables, and the detection of that environment is rather challenging at times. And then we've got some Fedora client side dependency issues that we need some help sorting out as well. Uh, so that's a huge opportunity for contributors to Fedora. So that kind of concludes the, the ADB talk. We didn't extend this to the full 50 minutes because we didn't want to just do a project presentation. That's terribly interesting, but it's not why we're here at FLAW. So are there questions about ADB? 
for those watching the recording, this is a 300 seat theater with all mm -hmm. seats taken. <laughs> and no questions. Okay, so why should we do this in Fedora? It is kind of the big question. Like, why do we care? It's a great project, but there's a lot of great projects. So we feel like the ADB project really speaks to the four foundations of Fedora. Freedom, well, this is interesting. Freedom, friends, features, and first, because I'm talking and I'm not allowed to say them without looking. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of unpack each of the foundations of Fedora and why I think the ADB project makes sense for Fedora to consider doing. So the first one, push the button frame, is an extra slide that I should have deleted. Next button frame. Yes, okay. Um, Freedom, it, it's free software. That's an easy one. We already said it was open source, so next. Friends. Today, Fedora is trying to attract more users. Specifically, one of the focuses Matt mentioned yesterday was developer users. One of the challenges I think that Fedora has in this is that A, we have two stories. Story number one is, install our desktop. It's fantastic. And Fedora desktop is fantastic. But for some developers, it's not an option today for them to run a Fedora desktop. They may be in an environment where they are required to run an alternative operating system. They may not be comfortable enough yet to make the move away from the environment they can be productive in to a full-blown Linux desktop. That, that may not need to be the piece of friction between us and the uh, developer user. So we offer option B, which is download our virtual machine and then use it as your desktop, please. Um, so basically, download a Fedora VM, SSH into it, and, and now you're running Fedora, but without having to reinstall your computer. That's not necessarily a whole lot less friction for a lot of the developer community. There's a lot of the developer community that these are fine options, but we're missing a huge share of the market with some of this friction. So we looked at some other things. We have the developer of Fedora Project Fedora website, which is a fantastic website. If you haven't gone there, go there. If your language or stack or testing tool or whatever is not properly documented, pull the repo, submit the patch, do it before flog is over. This is an important website. It is it's critical that we provide the information that will help developers get started. The challenge, though, is that this website still presumes that you are sitting at a Fedora prompt at a machine and that you're willing to take ownership of package management and other challenges on your machine. We all know these things are hard, but it's still friction between us and a potential developer user, developer member of our community. Fedora loves Python. Huge initiative, got mentioned yesterday by Matt as well. Again, we are tool server Python. We have lots of modules in Python. If you attended Miroslav Sufi's talk yesterday, you know that the Cobra project is doing an automated rebuild of every Python module and every Ruby gem. Like, we're very serious about this. We're very serious about making this work. But again, these things are predicated on the idea that you are sitting at a Fedora prompt. It should be, uh, all of these assume you're using Fedora. And, and I have this vision where we can draw in developers in a slightly less frictionable way. Less friction. So features. Um, we want to be first. We want to not be bleeding edge, but we want to be leading edge. We want to um, show best practices. Those are goals of Fedora project that align with the goals of the ADB. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, the other thing is, and I apologize for language. The idea here is basically we can deliver a Fedora that's useful regardless of whatever that developer's email layer is. Um, one of the challenges that a lot of people are looking for modularity to solve or for virtual machines to solve is, I want to be able to do something, but there may be a library conflict or something else that's going to destroy my email client or destroy my ability to browse the web. I can't have that happen. So how do I deal with that? ADB is one answer to that for some developers. Remember that developer Fedora project that Org I mentioned? This is what we talk about to like a Node.js developer. We say, look, all right, first you need to get our desktop. 
Okay, that's some level of, we got to do a conversion. Then we want you to install NPM from our packaging. Okay, that's actually pretty easy. Like, that is not a hard request once you've got somebody on the desktop. Then we want you to install all of your node modules using DNF. Okay, like fine, you know, if I've gone to a Fedora desktop, say I'm coming from a Windows world, if I've gone to a Fedora desktop, I'm willing to buy this. Like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm invested at this point, I'm cool. Um, on developers, we then give a small sermon about why using NPM installs directly is a bad idea. And maybe as a node developer from another platform, at this point I'm starting to get kind of annoyed, because like, I wasn't expecting that. But okay, you've got your reasons, they're good reasons, because they really are very good reasons. I'll, I'll keep buying into that. At that point, we then tell you, by the way, in order to actually use these modules you've just installed, you need to reconfigure your environment a little bit. You've either got to add an environment variable, or you've got to call things in your node code slightly differently. You need to do more configuration. So like, we're adding teeny tiny layers of friction at every point here. And then at the end we go, oh yeah, not all the modules that you may be looking for are there. So here's like more repositories and all of Coper where you can go start hunting for things that are going to be in line with what we've told you to do. But in the end you may have to bail into a local and solve for NPM anyway. And like at that point I'm worried that there's a, a, a community of developers who can ultimately become great users and potentially great contributors that we've lost with just this pile of paper cut friction. And maybe we can think about ways to solve that. ADB itself doesn't solve that, but it may provide us with a model that we in the Fedora project can grow larger to solve that. So in essence, this is what the Fedora Atlas page looks like. This is the Vagrant virtual machine download page. What I'm saying is today, we can add one to this, which is the ADB, and that gets us towards container developers. Tomorrow, we can keep adding to this, so that we can say, oh, you're a node developer. There's, I hope that slide's there. Yes, it is. There's a Fedora Node.js that you can use, and here's why you need to think about our Node.js environment, and what it's gonna do for you, and how it's gonna translate in production, and why it's better tested and better integrated and going to work better for you today. And so we turn those five friction commands, we hope, into something that's run a virtual machine provider that you're used to, because a lot of developers do use Vagrant, and it just works. There is no step four. Like, the friction becomes a whole lot less. Um, we can pre-configure the environmental setup. Eventually, hopefully, Cocoa will be rebuilding and we will have all the node modules. But until then, even then, we don't have to give the sermon because if they run into a conflict, it's in a VM that's just being used for node. At that point, we're not destroying somebody's virtual, you know, their email there. Oh, and can you step back for one second? Because we have marched over something that we should have said earlier. Um, I want to emphasize this. You can still use your preferred host editor. Um, Neither of us happen to use a project called Eclipse, which is a fantastic graphical user interface IDE development environment. But Eclipse also works with all of the ADB, and it can be, we were saying here, we can build these boxes, we can help you continue to use the tools you're used to while we're trying to show you options that are available in your future. So, uh, first, support advancement. There are things that Fedora does really, really well that a lot of other projects benefit from. There's a reason it's not just the Fedora operating system, it's the Fedora platform. It's a way to do it and accomplish things. One of our challenges, for example, with ADB is, right now the self-contained box is very large. Today we're building on a CentOS platform. CentOS gives us a lot of ability to build things. They have a SIG system that's similar to our working group system in Fedora. It gives us a lot of opportunity to, to put in the code that we need. But something as simple as solving our size problem, that's going to require us to go through and basically start repackaging the core of CentOS to reduce its size down. This is an exercise Fedora has already done a lot of as part of the Atomic Post project. So Fedora bringing this in is actually going to be able to contribute back to this upstream community by going, look, we've kind of already started to solve your size problem for you. 
because we have innovated. One thing that we find ourselves doing a lot in the ADB is, oh, we need X. It's not in CentOS. Okay. Well, our SIG lets us package it ourselves and get it and use it. So then we have to go through a packaging exercise. Fedora probably packaged it last week. Like, we can rely on Fedora, and Fedora can contribute back in this way, and everything moves forward in a, a very nice cycle. And ultimately, we want to drive people back into Fedora. Uh, packaging of binaries, as was mentioned, Fedora moves fast, the ADD moves fast, good synergies. And I think this is the last slide. So this is like the discussion part. Does this make any sense? Am I crazy? Is this a good idea? Don't answer both of those questions. Yes. Please don't answer them all yes either. But this is the part where you have to talk or I have the doors locked. So, what's the next step then? Since you're all in agreement, I will put all of you down to help us build this. Um, I'll get you all enrolled into the Fedora Plus working group. Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, the next step is to kind of take this to Fedora Cloud because that seems to be the appropriate working group because it doesn't, it seems to have passed the sanity test. Um, so to have a conversation in Cloud, Cloud is working on some related initiatives. They're looking at something called Project FAO, uh, Fedora Atomic Host, and or Fedora Atomic, I think I think they dropped the most, but it's Atomic Host and OpenShift. This is kind of related to some of those things. So we'll talk to Cloud. Hopefully some of you will be encouraged by this talk to want to be part of this. Um, you can either join the Upstream project or I encourage you to become part of the Fedora Cloud conversation around this that we will be starting. Um, I've also given some links here. There's the slides again. But the ADB project can be found on GitHub as well under the project Atomic namespace. It's the ADB Atomic Developer Bundle, and yes, names are even hard with GitHub projects. So please consider that. Uh, and then lastly, you can look at our homepage, projectatomic.io. So we're hoping there be more questions. At least it's a lot of smiles. And that, that was, I think, a lot. Did we talk for more than 20 minutes? Uh, yes. All right. Mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. Bye.